Uh, what I want to talk to you about today um, is to uh, give you an overview of some, a sort of a class of research activity that social scientists, and in particular uh, psychologists, uh, have been uh, responsible for, and that creates a, um, a particular uh, context within which policy uh, can best be uh, driven forward. Because often what people ask about is precisely how does research inform policy um, if your research is empirical, if your research is particularly quantitative and so on, what does that uh, generate by way of a policy context? And the uh, centre that I'm attached to relates to occupational and life stress, um, and it's a multidisciplinary uh, research centre, although the centre of gravity within the centre is certainly in psychology as a social science. Um, so one of the particular areas that many of you would be interested in um, in terms of a research uh, activity relates to how uh, behavioural, uh, social, psychosocial and um, uh, other factors uh, relate to well-being. I mean, what is the, uh, uh, sort of the, the relationship between socioeconomic climate and human well-being? Because ultimately, one of our aims as, a social, as social scientists is to through our policy advice to enhance human well-being. Now, a psychologist will tell you that human well-being can be quantified in a particular uh, type of questionnaire, but there are other indices as well that uh, are undoubtedly important. And one example, an early example of the type of research that people uh, uh, conducted to uh, social science research that has a big policy, public policy implication relates to our understanding of the factors uh, that uh, explain the relationship between social class and health. So Sir Edwin Chadwick uh, described how differing classes within the population had differing life expectancies in the United Kingdom. And the gentry were expected to have an average life expectancy of 35 years. Um, and this doesn't control for infant mortality and so on, but all these other caveats apply. Whereas labourers, mechanics, servants and so on had an equivalent statistic of 15 years, and this is a sort of a reality, it's a quantitative reality, but it has a public policy implication, no doubt. Uh, in contemporary terms, we're far more, we like to consider ourselves far more sophisticated in how we understand these concepts, how we describe them, how we quantify them, and so on. And for example, we can control for infant mortality, because it's not the case that the gentry uh, on average died at the age of 35, um, it's that the arithmetic average life span was 35 years when you included all the infants who died um, in early life. But we have more sophisticated ways and means, and there's a web link there that you can consult and see some very uh, neat uh, statistical models of uh, these types of factors in, um, in terms of contemporary standards and contemporary information. The, um, uh, more con more, um, one more example of a more contemporary version of this relates to the, uh, the way in which uh, social class is classified. This is the UK version. A very similar version is used in the uh, Republic of Ireland and the Central Statistics Office um, uh, in terms particularly of the national census. Um, but the UK statistics which relate to this, which is intended to be an ordinal scale, so number one is considered to have a greater amount of something or other than number two and so in turn. It's not an arbitrary list, it's intended to be an ordered list. Um, but that uh, life expectancy at birth, for example, in 1995 uh, is still higher, seven years, um, in the top of the scale compared to the bottom of the scale. So uh, it's not just that uh, sophistication in our analyses means that all of these problems go away. These factors do apply in contemporary society, not just in the 19th century. Uh, social class 5 children are more at risk of accidental death uh, than social class 1. Um, of the causes of death typically seen in men and in women, uh, they're far more uncommon in social class 4 and 5 combined than in all the other social classes and so on. Breast cancer, social class 1 women have a registered incidence of breast cancer higher than that of social class 5. That's because it's uh, more likely to be screened. So a registered incidence uh, is, uh, is a good thing. Uh, in something like breast cancer. If it's an unregistered incidence, that means incidents that has not been screened or not been detected. 
So there are all sorts of uh, mechanisms that might associate the socioeconomic climate with a person's physical well-being. Um, uh, very famous research studies led by psychologists and social scientists in the UK, conducted in the, on the civil service in London, so-called Whitehall studies, which are an ongoing research program uh, at University College London. Um, uh, they showed that lower grades of staff were more likely to have all of these types of things. Um, because there's a, the, the, not just that they're more likely to smoke, uh, they're, they're more likely to suffer ill health even when you control for things like smoking, they have poor health attitudes and so on. But there are also some interesting um, indices here. Fewer cars is, is kind of a proxy measure for household income and disposable income. If you have two cars, it means you probably have enough disposable income to throw around. If you have one car, it means you possibly uh, have less of that. So as a proxy measure, fewer cars is, is a quite a robust statistical association with all sorts of health outcomes. But there are these things, a sense of control over one's work, a sense of variety in one's work, uh, the skill required to do one's work, a sense of social support in life, in work, uh, in the community, um, a per hostile personality or reported psychological stress. These are also big indicators, statistically comparable to things like smoking, in terms of life expectancy and disease incidence in large-scale epidemiological studies. So uh, when we consider social sciences research um, and looking at the impact of so-called socioeconomic climate on uh, well-being, um, we need to bear in mind the social dimension as well as the economic dimension of, uh, of that type of concept. So there is a, a degree to which the um, functionality uh, of a person's relationship to their society uh, is an important predictor of outcome and well-being. Um, and so when we look at our life expectancies, the most profound predictor on a map like that is obviously the economic factor. Uh, Well-off countries have better life expectancies. Life expectancy is not the best measure, but it's probably the easiest to understand. Um, uh, but it's, uh, the better uh, off countries, more wealthy countries, tend to do better in health indices than poorer countries, uh, in some uh, gross measures at least. But even within the regions, there are core differences um, that are, aren't just economic, that relate to how society functions, to what uh, the, uh, the, the psychosocial expectancies are within a society as well. And the area that uh, I'm interested in, um, both from both a research and a policy perspective, is in the notion of stress. Um, and one example, um, I'll talk briefly about uh, workplace stress, but it's not just workplace stress. Well, workplace stress is a recognised hazard in all the relevant policy documents. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's identified by uh, the uh, WHO, for example, as equivalent to uh, hazardous exposures to chemicals um, and uh, biological agents and so on in terms of the number of people who are experiencing uh, adverse outcomes. Um, the Heart Foundation in Britain and in Ireland and America, the Heart Foundations identify workplace stress as one of the five or six key predictors of heart disease incidence. And a lot of research shows that something like, uh, of interest to social scientists like life stress uh, is as big a predictor of heart disease incidence in the population as is smoking. So the actual uh, actuarial uh, statistical association between uh, life stress and heart disease is of equivalent magnitude in terms of effect size as that for smoking. So we have a great appreciation of the impact of smoking on things like heart disease, or perhaps more so on cancer, but nonetheless on heart disease uh, substantially also too. Uh, but these other types of associations are also part of the picture. Right, so part of what I want to do is show you some uh, end product, if you will, um, on terms of how research looks in its sort of raw academic form but then to pick out some of the points of detail in each of these um, some, uh, examples as to how uh, a public policy uh, implication uh, is actually uh, embedded in what is being reported. Um, these are data from the Whitehall studies. Now, I don't expect you to study the entire thing, so I'll talk you through it if you like, and you can consult the, the figures in detail yourselves later. I'll just keep an eye on the time. Um, the... Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the Whitehall study is a large-scale study, a cohort of about 35,000 
civil servants in the London area, ranging from people with very poorly paid jobs to people with very well paid jobs, but a, an extensive screening of health and of psychosocial uh, measures as well, including workplace um, uh, stress and workplace uh, job um, issues, uh, like the degree to which your job requires varied skills or the degree to which your job is essentially boring or interesting. But in any event, um, they, uh, the focus of the, the research uh, paradigm was to compare high grade with middle grade with low grade workers. So when you actually take that approach and collect data, you can plot it somehow like this with a comparison for of low to medium, uh, sorry, low to the right, medium, and high grade. And what you see when you pick out the prevalence statistics are that um, uh, with general health questionnaire measures, um, the number of depression cases, of undiagnosed perhaps clinical depression cases in the three grades differed to a statistically significant extent. Now what I'm trying to do here is to present you with the end product, so I'm not talking you through how the statistics are analysed or what statistical tests were used, because I know many of you are doing different types of research, qualitative as well as quantitative. But I do want to sort of identify that so when you see a quantitative output like this, it's, there is actually qualitative meaning within it. Um, so the number of depression cases differed. Uh, people with a low grade of employment, and the, the British government would say that they look after their employees, all uh, sort of regulations and guidelines are adhered to, the standard of living and the standard of legal protection for occupational, uh, against occupational risk is higher in the UK perhaps than in, in most other countries, certainly higher in Europe than in most other places. And yet, having a low grade employment, that doesn't mean you no know, climbing up chimneys, cleaning them with your bare hands or anything, but just working in a boring, low paid job was associated with um, a one in three uh, rate of uh, depression symptomology verging on clinical depression. Um, now it's compared to 20% for high grade employment. So high grade jobs are stressful, but they're also rewarding, they're also stimulating, um, and uh, there are all sorts of other psychological protectors there. If you look at this second uh, uh, marked um, uh, index, it is decision latitude. And you see that it goes the uh, um, low decision latitude uh, maps on. So people with, this is a well sort of uh, established association in lots of different contexts. But the design of people's workplace, the extent to which they had decision over their own workload and the types of things they do on a day-to-day -day basis is strongly predictive of adverse outcomes. So when as social scientists we're considering what will make a community function better or a community within a workplace function better, um, and when we're interested in uh, measuring good and bad outcomes, we can reduce things down to pure mental health um, and talk about depression symptomology. But we also need to look at the sort of uh, ins and outs of the person's daily experience. So their decision latitude at work would be one way of doing that. And I would make the argument that although there's a reduction involved in that, um, you are performing a very clear mathematical demonstration of a problem. Um, and w when you have, sorry, qualitative methodologies to supplement that, you can make a very, very powerful okay, argument. Is it, the, Pardon me. is it okay for this question? Absolutely. To, to what extent, though, is that low grade actually conflated with home-like conditions? Because I assume if you're pulling in less money, you have more stresses at home, you're, like, how much is clinical depression actually factor of greater work as opposed to how that interacts with yeah. the rest of your life, right? Yeah, no, so that's 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 a, that would be a huge cross correlation. Absolutely. The no, there, the, no, there is. And, but the nature of the analyses here is, is the regression analyses and the attempts are made to factor out so these couple of... They're, they're work, actually, they're not, they're not stressful in the slightest. It's actually mm. just flagging up. Yeah. It's actually flagging up a home condition and not sure. the nature of their work. Well, the low decision last year, I mean, I don't want to in a sense get too bogged down in a single uh, case study or single study. But bear in mind, the low decision latitude is an assessment of the work that people are doing. And the low decision latitude, people who have less choice over, or less autonomy in their work will report more stress at work. They find the job is more stressful when someone else is telling you what to do rather than you deciding for yourself what you need to do. So that is a, an index of stressfulness at work. And they're just the, the regressions demonstrate associations across these variables in the manner described. So that that index of decision latitude and therefore work stress is a feature that is associated with depression scores as well. 
So naturally, I mean, you're making an excellent point, of course, that you need to control for the extent to which there are alternative explanations for these types of statistical associations. But there, there are ways and means to do that, and no seriously published research would ever uh, fail, uh, really, to, uh, to control out. So uh, these figures are a little bit high at the top end. They're 19%, which possibly suggests a degree of measurement error. But the comparison across the scales are separated um, and, uh, and statistically distinct. And so there is a, there's a big issue there. But in lots of populations in the community, and I want to talk to you about other populations as well, um, like um, uh, caregivers of children with disabilities and so on, there is an extremely high rate of undiagnosed uh, clinical anxiety and clinical depression in those types of groups as well. Um, but there are different explanations in, in, in different contexts. So the rate of undiagnosed mental health problems is extremely high, um, and that's a, that's a recognised phenomenon. Often uh, the stressfulness of work or the, 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 the misfortune economically of a person's living situation is such that it distracts a person from looking after their own mental health or forever being screened. A uh, caregiver for a child with disabilities, for example, is often more focused on their child's medical needs and mental health needs than their own. Um, but I want to just take it a little step further because what the Whitehall studies are more famous for uh, is distinguishing what some uh, social scientists would refer to as hard outcomes in, in terms of a health uh, index. So when you look at the number of coronary events, the high-grade, intermediate-grade, and low-grade uh, populations uh, differ uh, substantially in terms of, um, in terms of the, uh, the, the, the blood pressure, hypertension, um, body mass index and so on, um, but also in relation to practical social support, um, uh, low um, uh, uh, scores for having an emotional other or a confidential other or a confidant um, to um, uh, share your problems with and so on, and a relatively small social network. So, if you like, none of these um, statistical associations on their own would be um, uh, sufficient. But the picture being painted is of uh, a psychosocial predicament as well as a medical and an economical one. So in terms of being social scientists and forming policy, uh, we have, uh, we have a, a space within uh, these types of debates uh, and we have our own uh, evidence bases uh, to, to build on. All right. I mentioned the example of family caregivers. I want to um, uh, just offer you an alternative um, approach. Um, Again, um, caregivers of people with different... This is, these are family caregivers of uh, persons who have had a stroke. Um, so large-scale research studies often demonstrate the importance of um, a, you know, social support as uh, a buffer against adverse outcomes in these types of stressful um, events. Now, in Ireland, the number of people who die within a year of having a stroke is about three or four times higher than the, the, in the United States. Um, we have a very different approach to intervening with people post-stroke in Ireland uh, at the institutional level in terms of the, uh, the presence um, uh, in most countries of uh, specialised teams. But in Ireland, the sort of specialised team exists on paper only. They're not really a team. They don't necessarily liaise at all. Um, and people uh, in hospitalised uh, situations in Ireland um, who die within a year of stroke are, is extremely high. But one of the big predictors... Um, and, um, uh, and Pat uh, made reference to this type of issue in his talk. One of the big predictors of good outcomes in these situations are um, social and psychosocial predictors. So the extent to which people are feel empowered or feel um, uh, in control of their uh, care and their situation, and the size and, and nature of their social network, uh, the closeness of their uh, relationships with significant others, all of these ind indicators um, account for variance in the uh, prevalence of uh, morbidity and mortality, these kind of statistical or these uh, uh, constructs that we use uh, to describe uh, you know, health outcomes. What you have in this type of data is just to simplify it for you um, predictors of depression in caregivers themselves, um, social support networks, given that. Uh, in many countries, caregiving for people with disabilities or uh, in uh, adverse health uh, situations, like post-stroke, post-heart attack, and so on, um, a lot of the care relies on the community. It relies on the population to provide the service. Um, but what we do know is that it's very stressful for the people who are in that situation of providing the service, and uh, 
you can, and I would encourage you to consider in your research, actually isolating these causal factors in some kind of uh, systematic way using some kind of recognized statistical approach because you can make very powerful uh, statements. Um, social support is a, feature, is, a, is a statistical construct that keeps emerging as associated with health outcomes um, to a greater extent than most others. All right. I'll give you, um, you can study this example yourself in your own time, but this is a large-scale international study equivalent to the Whitehall studies in some respects, but it essentially makes the same point, that uh, stress at work, stress at home, all of these things are predictors, in statistical terms, of various outcomes. But what's interesting in this is, this is myocardial infarction, this is heart attack. And what they did was they got about 11 or 12,000 people with heart attacks, 11 or 12,000 age-matched and health-matched controls, or other uh, health indices at least, matched controls, and they uh, examined the prevalence of various psychosocial uh, indices across the two groups. And they found that um, there was a much higher, the type of way you'd read this, for example, is that uh, the people who reported having never had any stress at work, there was far more of them in the people who hadn't had heart attacks. The people who had heart attacks were far less likely to say they were never under stress, and far more, more likely to say they were uh, under stress most of the time. Um, but there are reasons at work, at home, gener in general, <coughs> or for other reasons that seemed to, be, uh, seemed to be generally the case. All right. Um, and that was the case for, for, for men and for women, uh, but to a greater extent uh, for men than for women. So uh, men who are report having high, in this particular study, among those who had had heart attacks, far higher numbers of them had said that they were under extreme stress at work. Um, and the odds ratio computed, and just for your interest, if you are a man and you're uh, feeling stressed at work, people who describe permanent states of stress were 2.34 times more likely to have had a heart attack than, than people who reported no stress ever. Uh, so that's the kind of uh, message that you can, uh, you can argue. But if you take, um, uh, and in, in the research center, uh, we have uh, members from the law department. If you take uh, the employer's responsibility for controlling workplace stress, if an employer is responsible for uh, elevating pressure to a point or it can be shown to be responsible for that, that, uh, that constitutes a potential workplace injury. So if you have statistical evidence from a large-scale study from over 50 countries with 20,000 participants, and you can say you're two and a half times more likely to have a heart attack if you are under a state of consistent stress, then uh, that's uh, a, an example of a research methodology or an argument that uh, helps, inform, helps inform policy. All right. Social support, again, um, uh, the type of, uh, this is the, I think the more or less the, um, the tail end of the actual uh, heavy statistical stuff. Um, but um, in terms of uh, uh, health outcomes, uh, symptomology, severe chest pain, ischemia, any heart disease events, this table shows you the uh, odds ratios as they're called for uh, different uh, psychosocial indices. Uh, so again, with the 35,000 sample or thereabouts, if you look at the one that's highlighted, people with low social support, 1.6 times more likely to have uh, angina than people with high social support. People, uh, they're 1.4 times more likely to have chest pain. Um, 2.17 times more likely to have diagnosed ischemia. So you can just really record the health outcomes, but the measurement of social support and the design of the research study is, is, is best, I would say, best left to social scientists. Um, because there are sort of different types of social support that might be of interest in these types of contexts. Okay. Um, I'll push on along past that one. It's, it's, it's just a simply another example. Right. So one question, one policy issue might be, if you have all sorts of different, and I'm going to give you sort of an overview of the type of research rather than give you all the literature, because there are simply thousands of studies. But if you have a uh, reason to believe that social support is uh, a contributor to good outcomes for people, um, both mental health and physical health outcomes. And given that social support is a feature of social networks, it's a, uh, a commodity uh, within communities, um, is it the case that if you employ social support, not cross-sectionally, but if you actually introduce it, does that lead to improvements and positive outcomes for people in different ways? 
Um, and uh, one, there are very few studies in this type of area. What happens if you introduce social support into a situation? Do you observe changes in the situation that corroborates the claim that social support is a buffer against uh, adverse outcomes? Uh, and uh, and this, is, but this is one example of this. And this is a particularly interesting example because it shows how social scientists can demonstrate um, using sort of standard uh, psychosocial, psychometric um, uh, measures, can demonstrate the associations they're talking about statistically, and can do so in an intervention trial. Uh, so you can have a before and after situation. But this, this study also quantifies in economic terms. Uh, they had economists uh, contribute to the research to show the amount of money that was saved by uh, using these types of social interventions rather than medical interventions. So again, you're talking about, in this case, a sample of people who have experienced stroke um, and their caregivers. And we know that caregivers in these types of situations have high rates of mental um, um, uh, problems of themselves and mental health problems themselves. Um, but what if you uh, offer social support? So the, the, the type of study here was that a sample of uh, caregivers were brought into a community training uh, situation in the local hospital and offered informational support and emotional support on a systematic basis across uh, a long period of time, several weeks, several months in fact, although I can't remember specifically the details. Um, and the, um, so there are two columns of data. There are the people who just got uh, conventional uh, support, aftercare in hospital sense, and uh, were simply told, uh, this is how your body works and this is what you need to do every day and goodbye. And then there are people who are given so-called carer training. Now this isn't the people with the stroke, it is the people who are caring for the person with the stroke. And uh, the carer outcomes, um, in all of these indices, anxiety and depression, using the Euroqual quality of life measure, the European Union approved measure of that. All of these showed strong, because statistically the lower the p-value, the stronger the association, strong improvements uh, for people having received the care intervention, which is designed by uh, social workers and psychologists and so social scientists, not by medics. Um, they showed statistically significant uh, improvements in all of these indices. Caregiver burden score is a sort of a measure sociologists use just to quantify uh, the sense that a person feels of being burdened by their caregiving responsibilities. Um, um, now, the figures look small in raw terms, and they are over-summarized, in my opinion, there. But the number of zeros in the p-values gives a better impression, really, of the size of the, the difference between the groups. But the, the missing part on the uh, slide uh, relate to the outcomes for patients. Did this follow through to patients? Not only are, is the caregiving burden in the uh, social network of the patient being uh, relieved, but is that of interest to the patient? Does that actually improve their outcome? Because after all, you could argue, being facetious, that if you convince caregivers that life is great and life is, uh, you only live once and you should be happier, they might actually end up neglecting their caregiving responsibilities and uh, doing all sorts of things that would be bad for the patients themselves. So, not wanting to be facetious on the, on the data uh, specifically, we find, uh, this, the researchers here found again, huge statistically significant improvements in anxiety and depression and the quality of life in the patient recipients of care. And remember, it wasn't the patients who got any intervention, it was the caregivers who got the intervention, as well as, and there are a variety of medical indices of mobility and post-stroke function <coughs> also showed improvements in the uh, target population in that particular research study. So this is one research study that shows that by understanding the uh, social context, the psychosocial mechanisms that contribute to caregiving and social networks involving uh, people in need, um, we can perhaps uh, speculate that there are ways to improve people's well-being, um, drawing on that knowledge rather than a medical model. And then it's a research study that employs that reasoning to intervene to demonstrate the effects um, after the intervention. Um, institutionalization, um, statistically significantly fewer people were re-institutionalized following the stroke. Uh, these are controlled for medical severity and all sorts of things like that uh, after the carers received uh, social support based uh, care training. Now, the researchers uh, published the report in the British Medical Journal and on the very next page 
of the same issue, they published another report based on the same study. So that's, that's two for the price of one, in a sense, but, the, but with a different lead author. Um, but that's, that's good strategy from an academic point of view, I suspect. But bear in mind, the graphic here is probably one of the worst kinds of, types of tables um, that you're, you're likely to see, but it's the standard format used. So have a good look at your printout, because what it shows you is uh, the same type of analysis, except the, with a bottom line added. And the bottom line, I've circled in red there, and I'll talk you through it. Um, the group who received uh, standard care, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the costs um, of, uh, these are in British pounds, the costs um, of, um, yeah, the, group, the first group were those who didn't receive the informal care, didn't receive the intervention. The costs were 10,544 as compared to the people who were in the control group cost. Um, excuse me, I'm going to do the figures actually backwards there. The grouping, anyway, the, 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 these are bottom lines. The training, oh yes, this is the group I should be comparing, my mistake. Left to right. Um, so the, the, the basically the bottom line was a comparison of 11,000 uh, for the people who received the training, the caregiver training, compared to, I told you the table was poor. Uh, compared to 15,000 uh, for the people who were in the control group. Strong statistical difference in the region of uh, 4,000 or um, approximately 40% of the overall cost. So there, there's an economist on board to demonstrate that this psychosocial intervention has a saving uh, to the institution, the healthcare system, um, that can be quantified. And that can build the argument. And it's uh, offered here as an example of how social science methodologies uh, can be used to argue for particular policy initiatives. Because often you're not just, it's not sufficient just to demonstrate the evidence base for the success of an intervention. It's often required that you are able to comment on how good and how valuable it is uh, in, 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 in more compelling terms. So it's not just to say that it is better than the alternative, but to quantify, um, maybe you add rhetoric to the argument as to how uh, beneficial it might be. Um, so I would... Um, uh, uh, summarize in this kind of way what social scientists have found about how these, because these are often impacts that I mentioned earlier about stress and well-being. What is it that social scientists have to say about that? And in summary form, uh, the, the key moderators that are of interest to us, because people can smoke and they can drink and they can lay, live next, near, next to chemical factories and inhale all sorts of toxins. Um, but people will sometimes argue that smoking and drinking are amenable to social intervention. It's not just increasing the price of alcohol or banning cigarettes. Um, you can, you can uh, use an understanding of the social network processes to influence the extent to which people drink and smoke. Can do less about, uh, about uh, chemical factories and so on. But of perhaps um, equal interest uh, in a lot of these types of cases are the, the softer measures, if you like, which also have very strong statistical associations. So the sense in which a person feels uh, and control of their life is a strong predictor of positive mental health and positive physical health. And that feeds into the overall argument as to how we organise our societies and what policies we develop to advise on how, what we do next. Social support is a key particular component and ingredient of that understanding. Now, there's a whole story to be told about social support in its own right in terms of how best to quantify it, how best to even, whether, whether quantifying it is even a good thing to do, or how best to define the term. But also, and I'll just uh, also share with you from a psychologist's point of view, there's a strong, um, and this is an important from a, a sort of a research policy perspective, there's a strong um, personality dimension to all of these predicaments as well. Not everybody uh, will uh, uh, respond the same way to an intervention, for example. If you are in, um, a care, if you're a parental caregiver of a child with a disability, some parental caregivers will uh, respond very well, in fact, they come to rely on third-party intervention. Other, uh, so, so you, you will, um, we do a certain amount of research with parent, parental caregivers of children with autism, and some of them will go to every autism meeting that's on, will be a member of every autism network, and so forth. Other parents will actually take the opposite coping approach, and they'll take it, it compatible with their personality, which would be to step away from all of that, to avoid the reminders of all of these uh, future stressors, 
and to live each day as it comes and to focus on your child as a unique being, not want something as part of a, of a diagnostic category. So there are big personality, what we would call personality differences, that are worth bearing in mind as well. Um, I mean, there are two slides of examples of personality. One is uh, in a, what, what some psychologists call esteem. Um, by logic, now esteem is, is not, self-esteem is a term that gets overused. But self-esteem might best be described as how confident you feel that you're going to cope with what life throws at you. Um, if you have low self-esteem, it probably means you're not that confident. If you have high self-esteem, it probably means you, can, you, you approach situations with confidence. There are psychometric measures of that. It's a robust uh, construct. It's been measured cross-culturally. Uh, it has high uh, stability. If you're a person with high self-esteem now, you're likely to have high self-esteem in the future. All of these types of things. The same percentages of people uh, occupy the extremes in different cultures and so forth. Uh, there are lots of different ways in terms of measuring and describing that notion, um, but you can uh, incorporate it into empirical or quantitative research methods very easy, survey studies very easily, and that's regularly done. And it's a strong predictor of all of these positive and negative outcomes. But the important message is that it demonstrates that not everybody will respond the same way. People who have particularly low confidence about their situation will respond less uh, functionally, less adaptively, to attempts to uh, support uh, them than people who have already a high baseline of confidence and a high baseline of optimism about the future. So I would argue that these types of uh, terms that get used in the literature are worth looking at in any social science context because we have to remember that the, the community is made up of individuals and what works for one size might not fit another size. So there are, uh, there's a need for complexity and subtlety in what it is we suggest uh, for people rather than to overgeneralize that this type of thing should be introduced everywhere because uh, the evidence says that it leads to improvement. Um, you know, a variable you might be interested in is hostility and anger. Uh, internationally, studies have uh, demonstrated for, since the 1960s at least that uh, people who score high for anger, uh, you might wonder how anger is, uh, is, is measured. Uh, there are a variety of questionnaires. Uh, but there are also some observational techniques, some, some structured interview methodologies that allow the interviewers to score people for their tone of voice as well as the things you can't pick up on in questionnaires, as well as what they actually say. But uh, we know that this is, this is just a, a, a test score on a short 30, 40 item questionnaire. And it's a strong predictor of blood pressure and cardiovascular health in particular. It, it almost falls into the stereotype of if you're prone to anger, your face will turn red and you'll have high blood pressure. Um, but there are all sorts of ways and means of showing that people who score high for hostility have higher blood pressure than people who score low for hostility. Um, and I'll just give you an example of why, I mean, I, I do a lot of research on blood pressure, but I'll just quantify for you in simple terms why that might be more interesting than it at first appears to a social scientist. That we know that uh, social support impacts on blood pressure, we know that self-esteem impacts on blood pressure. People high and low in social support self-esteem have higher and lower blood pressure on a random sample of their day. Not just in a doctor's surgery, but on any measure on any given day. And um, people who have high blood pressure are more prone to disease. And disease, obviously, is a drain on the economy and drain on quality of life in society generally. Uh, but just to put it in figures for you, um, your blood pressure is measured in millimetres of mercury. And when you drink a cup of coffee, your blood pressure on average goes up four millimetres of mercury because uh, caffeine is a stimulus, stimulant and uh, on average, if you're a daily caffeine drinker, your blood pressure will be four millimetres of mercury higher than the person sitting next to you uh, if they don't drink caffeine. Um, but if everybody stopped drinking coffee, that would mean the population blood pressure will go down four millimetres of mercury um, and actuarially, uh, because we have statistics for millions of people in this case, not tens of thousands or hundreds, millions of people, actuarially that difference uh, would reduce stroke death by 20% in the population and heart disease death by 15% in the population. So a little change in something like your average blood pressure makes a big difference in terms of the population health. You mightn't notice a difference in your health because your heart disease is just going to be part of an overall picture in uh, perhaps in your cases not even for, for another 30 years before that becomes clearly apparent. But um, uh, it, on a population level, those types of small differences make, make, uh, make big differences to population health. 
In terms of policy then, if we know that social intervention, social support, life, stress, all of these types of things that social scientists are interested in, if we know that there's actually some strong association with blood pressure, then you'll have another string to your bow, another angle on your argument. I'm not suggesting everybody incorporates blood pressure into their research designs, but I'm just giving you an example of maybe the type of reasoning that makes a social science finding a compelling argument for a change to public policy. It's just a, a form of evidence that can be incorporated in some cases. But it's good, in other words, to focus on what, what are the outcomes? What can we stand over and say from, as social scientists? This is what we know. What we do in our research is it got us a PhD, it got us three or four publications, it got us a job. But what did it actually do for society? What are the advantages to the taxpayer for investing on in the research? Um, we, we do need to have an eye on how solid our research is in terms of how well we can stand over the implied cause and effect relationships. And be that a qualitative research study or a quantitative research study, we need to have confidence uh, that what we're saying is a generalizable finding. But also then, the nature of the outcomes that we're studying, are they actually outcomes that, uh, maybe not in our study, we're not looking at people dying, but maybe um, we know that this has, uh, from other research, large scale research, that these, have, uh, these are among the long term implications in terms of improving quality of life for people in society. Um, so human well-being, which is the point at which I, I started at the outset, is, is uh, determined by a multiplicity of factors. That's the one point I would say. We're social scientists, but we cannot avoid uh, listening to what others have to say. As psychologists, we can't avoid listening to geographers and economists and sociologists, and then also all the other way around as well. But we even can move into medical areas, uh, business areas, and other um, uh, ways in which social systems um, can be, uh, can be reflected upon. Um, the adaptive functioning of communities is, is very, it's nice, it's, it's, it's a good thing, obviously, but it is felt the end user is the individual citizen, and the adaptive functioning of communities makes life easier for everybody. That's the, the, the concept that I would argue, because you can talk about adaptive functioning, adaptive communities, but what we really um, well, need to uh, incorporate in some way is how the individual end user will feel about that. And uh, a psychology approach perhaps predisposes you to look at things in that way. But as social scientists, it all comes down to, to, to the, the, the average or the unique individual experience or the average individual experience, depending on your particular approach. Um, and as social scientists conducting research with a view to informing public policy, I would encourage you to be interdisciplinary and to be holistic, although I don't always like that term. Um, terms like psychosocial I've used in the talk. Other people use terms like biopsychosocial. That is taking account of uh, maybe the, more explicitly the health outcomes in my research area, but just the, the general sense of combining theoretical and academic paradigms to generate comprehensive assessments and comprehensive recommendations. Um, and another point I would argue, perhaps reflecting my discipline, but is that the individual um, uh, should not be forgotten when studying social systems. Because individuals vary, and what works you know, for one person might not work for another. And uh, a simple thing is a housing policy for um, uh, infirm uh, adults in their old age. You know, some people would love to work, live in a communal setting with, surrounded by other uh, older adults. Other people would hate that. But if you have a, a research finding that says this is good, you know, the danger is that you then roll it out for everybody. But there is a huge individuality question in just about all these uh, phenomena, and that needs to be uh, remembered. Uh, and social scientists can, in general, and should, in my opinion, offer evidence bases for their policy recommendations. I think that's a consistent message, regardless of your discipline. But can also contribute to cost-benefit analysis, and should seek to do so. Because you might have a, a benefit to offer, but if it comes at a cost, then people are better off where they started from rather than taking your advice. So to be bearing in mind the advantages and disadvantages and have a, that degree of uh, open-ended um, assessment uh, incorporated in, in what it is that you do. All right, uh, that's more than enough for myself. So um, I have, um, there's a web link there and if you really want the slides, and I'm not suggesting you desperately want them, you can download them because I put them up there. So there's some of the details there and some of the web links then you can just click through to, uh, to the original sources. Okay, thank you very much.